All right, again, I'm Aiden Gibson. Please welcome David Anderson, our Northeast Watershed Project Manager, and Jeff Yulman, a PM and Innovation Lead at Michael Baker. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. I think so. Um, so since the dawn of computing, we have come up with a number of different tools and uh, programs and softwares to improve uh, the efficiency with which we evaluate you know, various problems, um, support design, analysis, and all of that. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about a relatively new uh, program in radon mesh modeling, uh, specifically in HECRAS 2D. So radon mesh modeling is opening doors to the future for us. Uh, it's, it's helping us see all the layers of the egg, so to speak, uh, to tie it back to what Laura said this morning. Um, I'm gonna tie everything back to our Niver Creek pilot, and this is just kind of the agenda that we're gonna go through today, so we'll dive into each one of these topics in a little bit more detail. Uh, Niver Creek is a West Bank tributary to the South Platte River. Uh, Michael Baker uh, is the lead consultant on this. Um, and our local government partners are Adams County, uh, the city of Thornton, and Federal Heights. Um, so rain and mesh modeling gives us a full picture of the watershed, whereas our typical 1D riverine modeling approach uh, really just shows us the flooding extents along the, the main river itself. Um, so it gives us the, the picture of the pluvial aspect or that localized and ponding. Um, it's a little bit more enhanced accuracy and resolution throughout the, the system. Uh, it is a more realistic representation of the overall watershed and reduces the assumptions and some of the, the uh, modeling approaches. Um, it gives us a gridded output with a large variety of variables to look at and better dissect the uh, uh, various components that can help inform us of hazard, which translate into risk. And once we define the risk, we can come up with various solutions to uh, reduce that overall risk. And then we can use that to um, you know, match that up with how much does a project cost and, and really help with prioritization in, in a uh, risk per dollar reduction type fashion. Uh, this dovetails in nicely with uh, FEMA's approach to uh, the future of flood risk data. FEMA's moving away from a binary in slash out approach into a more graduated risk. Um, so the top there is just showing, you know, those, those uh, X's are showing the um, flooded buildings and then everything else is not flooded, whereas below it's showing more of a, uh, a graduated approach or a percent risk uh, give, given at one of those structures. So it gives us a, a better picture of what exactly is happening for a wider variety of events rather than, ju the, than just the 100 year. Uh, this also ties back to um, our, our rain on mesh modeling approach is similar to what FEMA is doing. They're looking at uh, three current pilot watersheds, and then they're looking to expand their rain on mesh modeling after developing standards to the rest of the nation over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, so the current 1D riverine framework, and hopefully that animation's playing, you really can't see the screens here, so I'm, I hope it's synced, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> but all the, the red lines there are essentially cross sections. So for a 1D approach, you know, you have to manually place all those cross, cross sections to make sure you're capturing any sort of change in slope along the stream profile as well as the, the geometry in the channel. Um, so it's a lot of manual effort. And then each one of those cross sections is a computation point. So you get a flow, a depth, water surface elevation, velocity at each one of those singular cross sections. Uh, a 2D rain and mesh framework, you know, there's actually rain falling across the entire watershed and you can see where every single uh, raindrop is being routed. So each one of those black polygons there is a, um, a cell and along each one of those cell faces is essentially a cross section. And then there's a unique stage storage curve developed for each one of those cells to give a, a much higher resolution to the entire model and it's, it's essentially a, a much higher density of cross sections throughout. So you get a lot more data. Um, this gives us a, uh, a gridded output for a wide variety of events. You know, we can get that uh, annual percentage chance of flooding, which is shown on the top there with the red being the two year all the way up to the thousand year storm. 
Um, it can give us velocity in times depth, velocity isolated or depth uh, uh, isolated across a wider variety of events. So, rain on mesh methodology. How do we develop a rain on mesh model? Well, first we start with the terrain, uh, and then we use that terrain to develop watersheds or where that hydrology is going to be routed. Uh, and then that's brought into um, a mesh for that given area. And, you know, that's where we develop uh, brake lines and, um, you know, put in the various hydraulic features such as bridges and all of that to make sure that uh, we're capturing where all the water is going to be routed throughout the system. Um, and then hopefully we have some calibration data to validate that the model is telling us something realistic. Um, so we'll calibrate the model and then we can route a number of different rainfall scenarios, whether that be an observed event, a design storm to look at a greater uh, range of possibilities within that model. And the real strength of, of rain on mesh modeling is the, the ease with which some of the underlying layers can be swapped out to um, look at a different scenario. You know, for example, we can swap out the, the Mannings layer to look at a, a future land use scenario, and that instantly changes our impervious and um, other runoff uh, roughness parameters with just switching, you know, referencing that layer as opposed to a number of manual modifications to changing inflow hydrographs or various things like that. Uh, so it's a much faster way to look at uh, a wider range of things. Um, so I'm not going to go through each individual parameter here, but the, the gist of this slide is to basically say on the left, um, the 1D modeling approach has a number of different assumptions, whereas the 2D rain on mesh approach allows the model to compute all of these various variables. Let's take the, the flow path, for example, for a subcatchment. You know, you develop a, a single flow path, maybe that's based on a, an average weighted or, or something like that, but you have a singular value for that flow path. Whereas in a rain and mesh model, you know, the rain is falling on the grid and then the, the, the topography and roughness and other factors are routing that throughout the system. So it more uh, accurately uh, per, uh, estimates how that's going to be routed through the system. Man, you got to really push this thing. Um, <laughs> so there, there isn't a current regulatory framework uh, for 2D rain on mesh modeling to uh, develop pluvial floodplains. But as we know, where it can rain, it can flood. Uh, the photo on the right there is showing uh, that they're, you know, in an urbanized area, where is the river in that picture? You know, you, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell, so our current 1D riverine framework may not necessarily capture that. Um, so that's why we're moving towards rain on mesh modeling to, to better capture the entire risk for the whole system and tie it back to the, the larger uh, safety message throughout today. Um, so the the various colors there are showing that graduated risk with the, the red being the 2% or the, um, the two year, all the way up to the thousand year in the green. And then if you can see that black uh, line, that's our um, proposed floodplain coming out of the rain on mesh modeling. Um, as you can see, it doesn't necessarily capture all of the colors and that's because there's a number of different ways that you can filter out those results, whether that's through you know connectivity, uh, various size of islands um, and things like that. So how does that tie back to NIVR? Uh, so this is the NIVR Creek FAD uh, uh, floodplains in the black hatch there as compared to the rain on mesh modeling results in blue. So as you can see along the river, you know, it's the FAD floodplain is a little bit wider. Um, so we're digging into some of those details and maybe next year you'll hear about what those details are. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but then it also shows flooding in the, in the more urbanized areas, so we're just seeing that bigger picture of flooding all throughout the system and not along that, just that river. And the photo on the right there is uh, capturing the full floodplain for the entire Niver area. Um, so why do we want to go beyond the floodplain? Uh, just tying it back to the overall safety message today, you know, it, it informs us of all of the risk and not just the risk along the, the river. Um, it allows us to look at a wider range of events rather than just the 100 year. You know, we can look at um, all these different metrics at various structures and estimate the impacts to the public. We can better understand the depth, velocity, or the duration of flooding at a structure or along a road, and, and then the associated probability with those factors. Uh, and then uh, all of that can culminate to uh, better 
prioritize mitigation uh, actions, um, investments, and hopefully losses avoided, you know, once we start comparing those things and seeing where we can get the most bang for our buck in the future. And with that, uh, it, it's tying hazard back to the bigger picture of risk, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff. Press it really hard. All right, so gotten the fair <laughs> heads up here. All right, so David gave a good overview of rain on mesh modeling, why it's important, what we can do with it, and then why we would wanna go beyond the regulatory floodplain. And there's a number of reasons. Pulluvial, like David mentioned, is, is a great one, but it's certainly not the only one. And that's because it's more than just about accurate mapping. We want to be about um, informed decision making, as John had said earlier on as well. So the first step in that is having comprehensive uh, hazard data, which we believe that you can uh, extract that information pretty well from rain on mesh models. And then we want to translate that to risk by intersecting it with different receptors. Once you have hazard and risk in that format, you can aggregate that at different levels, whether it's at the watershed level, areas of interest across project reaches, and then we can also look at the effects of mitigation action or in specific projects and measure that in terms of risk reduction and hazard mitigation. And then we can aggregate that information and assess um, the relative impact of each of the projects to then prioritize and, and make these um, I guess justified projects. And what I really love about that approach is that it shifts the floodplain management conversation. It's no longer a conversation or a battle about moving a line on a map. It's not about if you're in or out. It's about did you actually reduce that person's risk? And so that's, that's kind of the end goal here. Um, so on the left-hand side, this is showing depth times velocity, also called flood force or uh, flood, flood momentum. And a lot of uh, us deal with hazard in a pretty limited space in the current framework. It's usually just inundation extent, sometimes water surface elevation or depth. But there's a number of different things you can extract out of a rain on mesh model that are just kind of inherently built in within defaults, such as like shear stress or even things like the duration at which a certain depth is exceeded. But one of the more promising uh, data sets that we've been using is this depth times velocity, or DV, which is shown on the left-hand side here. And so that's just a measurement in terms of you know, feet squared uh, per second, and it can help show relative hazard in the floodplain. And another way to look at it is it kind of tells you which area is the most hazardous area within a floodplain, and then you can uh, put these into different risk categories as well, which I'll get into in a minute. But on the right-hand side, that shows the relative threat based on what's the primary driver. So if it's being driven either by depth or by velocity or by the, the product of the two. So I'm curious, by show of hands, how many people are familiar with the graphic on the left or have at least seen this before? Okay, great, so some people have. It's, it's from a decade or a study about a decade ago. Uh, Australia has kind of adopted this into their framework for floodplain management as well as parts of Europe. Um, but it's actually a, a really useful tool, and I, I know no one can necessarily read it, but in the lower left-hand corner, starting, it breaks it into uh, hazard categories from H1 through H6, and H1 is basically generally safe. It's shallow, slow-moving water. H2 is that next one, that kind of teal cover, color, and that's when it's generally unsafe for smaller vehicles. Once you get to H3, it's unsafe for all vehicles, able to kind of move them away, as well as for children and elderly being swept off their feet. H4 is unsafe for all people, including they put a professional stuntman in a flume. This is how they test this stuff. As well as they put children in the flumes, several of them as well. So those are some brave children and questionable parents. Um, <laughs> But then H5 is when you get to potential damage to structures, and then H6 is that last category, which is just a bad place to be. It's likely structural failure. So you can um, classify your floodplain in that regard. And what I like about that is that it translates from hazard to risk, because most of what we deal with today is simply just hazard. We're just looking, again, at an inundation extent. Sometimes we'll do you know, building counts in terms of saying how many structures are in the floodplain, but we're not actually looking at a risk profile, which is something that we want to be moving toward. 
And the thing is, like, you can have as much hazard as you want, and if you don't have a receptor in the mix, then it's not posing a risk. But the minute that you put a receptor in that place, whether it's a person, a property, infrastructure, and that can be trails, crossings, roads, et cetera, now that there, there's actually a risk to be uh, assessed here. So this is an example of how we did that with dead times velocity, and we looked at the H2 category. Again, that's uh, a risk of uh, sweeping away uh, lighter vehicles. And so on the left is an annual exceedance probability map or an AEP heat map, and that basically shows the likelihood at which um, a vehicle would be at risk. And so we, for this analysis in particular in Niagara Creek, we did 14 different recurrence intervals from the two year to the thousand year, so we're looking at a wider spectrum. And when you see it in red, that basically means every event that we modeled, it would have the potential to carry off a vehicle, whereas in green, it would be only the more rare, larger events. Um, we made a, a safe assumption that people aren't driving their cars in creeks or in greenways, so we only cared about the road network, and we dropped a bunch of receptor points, which is what you see on the right-hand side, and we attribute it with the underlying AEP. Once you have it in that format, you can do really any kind of statistics you want, whether it's summation or averaging or other kinds of statistics, just to look at what is the relative risk in that area, and then we aggregated it at a gridded level. And when you do this, you can get a really good picture of your watershed as a whole which helps you to manage it either at that level or at any level that you'd like to, um, as well as drilling down into uh, figuring out what are these hot spots. Because now we're ranking it by a percentile in terms of showing where is their greatest risk to vehicles in the watershed, and that's what's shown on the right-hand side. So kind of using that going in reverse, in this example here I'm showing structure-specific average annualized loss um, that's been normalized against the structure value. Basically what that means, this is the potential for damage to a structure irrespective of how much that structure costs. Um, and you can see on the far left-hand side, there's you know, several squares that really pop out. So these are the areas that have the highest potential for structural damage and you wonder why that is. And so then you, you can go into those specific squares and then draw upon where, where are those hot spots and then get down to the structure specific level and even review field conditions. And what I love about this approach is you're not chasing every anomaly. You don't have to look through thousands of points now and see anything that has a color. Instead, it's really just kind of drawing out to your attention where, where are the ones that are the true needle movers. And in this last example of kind of that gridded approach, we're actually overlaying two different ones now where we're looking at risk and then population demographics. So on the left here, this shows um, a portion of the population that does not have access to a vehicle. So safe to assume these are gonna be pedestrians more frequently. So if we think of pedestrians, that puts us in the H3 class, which presented a risk to children and elderly in particular. And so that's what's shown in the middle there. That's the likelihood at which, or how often, that hazard three class is exceeded. And so if we take the two of those and we say where, the, where they're most often or most likely to be pedestrians, where is their risk of pedestrians, now we can combine those. And it really narrows it down to here are your four primary areas that you should focus on first. So just in this framework, it helps with decision making rather than trying to scan an entire watershed. And so that's the whole goal here, right? It's not just to make cool analytics and, and dive into the data, but it's to help inform these decisions. And so tying it back to John's uh, presentation in, in terms of confluence, these are four of the layers that we'd want to build into that. And the first one, values at risk, which John uh, explained to us earlier, it's the people, per, uh, property, infrastructure, anything that's posed as a receptor to that risk. Uh, the second one is the problem identification. This would be uh, identifying those needle movers, those hot spots through this gridded analysis, or as it stands today, those are all the digitized um, actions from the master plans. And then in the third one, the proposed actions, these would be potential projects or solutions that would hopefully mitigate that risk. 
And then the fourth one would be a problem group. So it's a way of um, aggregating this information and looking at project-specific polygons to help do that uh, risk ranking. And then you can actually prioritize your projects. So I know we kind of threw a lot out there. The point is, is that Rain on Mesh really does provide you with the robust data that you need to where then you can make um, actionable decisions. So thank you for your time. <laughs>